see where people spontaneously develop memorial remembrances on their own, but the United States actually had no formal remembrance until the inauguration of President Biden. So what do we know about COVID deaths? So COVID deaths are not only deaths of individuals who died of COVID. So we want to be very careful and also talk about death in the time of COVID. So remember I showed you people in nursing homes also died of all the things they always die from, Alzheimer's disease, pneumonia, kidney failure, et cetera. All those deaths also happened during the pandemic and those families, just like the COVID families, were not allowed to be present and grieve. So grief in the time of COVID is a bad death, but the dying of COVID in particular is actually a horrific death. These are deaths that are marked by considerable pain and discomfort and separation. So a bad death violates our now cultural expectations for a peaceful death and a bad death involves suffering. This distress was compounded by social isolation and other stressors like not being able to fly across the country and the loss of face-to-face -face mourning rituals. And then finally, what did we do then? So we had virtual memorial services. We do distance support groups. I'll talk about that a little more. These are innovations that funeral homes and programs like mine and hospitals had to very quickly pull together rapidly for those people who were suffering from COVID, from families that were grieving COVID deaths, and for families that were grieving COVID-affected deaths or deaths in the time of COVID. So this has launched a lot of efforts, especially among older adults. There are now renewed efforts to promote advanced care planning, to help people uh, obtain care that's concordant with their wishes rather than just absolutely ventilating people. Or the other side of that coin is, coin is withholding ventilation from someone. So making sure that people get care that's incongruence with their wishes. But now more than ever, we have time and the opportunity to design programs that target the grief, the grief needs of bereaved per persons that takes into account their own needs, their preferences, and their anxieties. So now more than ever, we have an opportunity to transform grief care in the United States. So let's step back a little bit from COVID for a minute. I think you guys are probably all COVIDed out. So I'm going to step back a little bit. We'll talk about normal grief and how grief should work. So as you probably know, grief is a normal part of life. The miraculous part of capacity to grieve. We all in ourselves, in our bodies, our minds and our spirits have an innate ability to grieve. But grief is a miserable human experience. And the more significant the loss to an individual, the more intense, not necessarily difficult, but the more intense the grief will be. But grief is also highly individualized. Everyone does this differently. So I will just remind all of us, there are no stages of grief. That is um, sort of a grief varies widely according to the relationship we had with the person who died, according to the personality of any grieving person, according to the norms within each individual's culture and family, some of us grew up in families that said, you don't cry. Some of us grew up in families that says, you don't talk about it. Others of us grew up in families where it was perfectly fine to talk about things and cry and be a demonstrative. 
But each person also grieves according to the other stresses in their life. And I just have to say, good luck finding a griever that doesn't have some other stress going on right now. And then we all know people who have very good coping skills and other people who don't have very good coping skills. And oh, th that all shows up when people are grieving. So even though there are no The most important thing that we want people to do at the start of their grief is actually to recognize the reality of the death and the permanence of the loss. And so when people have been prepared, they know the death is coming, they have a chance to sort of prepare their hearts for it. And when the death happens, they understand unequivocally that that person is dead. Now imagine how different that is if you didn't get to see the person die, if you couldn't be there, or if it was a person lost in combat and the body has not been recovered yet, or if a person has been lost or drowned or we haven't found the body. It's much harder for people in that circumstance to recognize the reality and the permanence of the loss. So they're shocked goes on for quite a bit longer. But this is actually where all of us on this call can be most helpful. And that is the next sort of milestone of grief, and that's the ability to express and process the thoughts and feelings related to the loss. The third milestone, and I'll talk about this a little more in a moment, is to be able to adjust to an environment where the deceased is absent, and then finally, we hope that a grieving person is able to take the love they would have given in that relationship and invest it somewhere else while remaining engaged in their memory with the person who died. So building a new life, but still being connected to the person who died. So here's my one of my little jokes for you today. This used to be taught in school. I learned this when I was in graduate school, that these are the stages of grief. Well, some very wise person had a little fun with that and said, oh no, it's a lot like that. It's all wiggly and it's a mess, and it is a mess. And I want you to know that's not just lines backing, bouncing back and forth. That feels like barbed wire to a grieving person to have emotional outbursts and then say, gosh, I, I have hope I can make it. And then the very next moment be full of fear or anger. This is actually what it feels like. All right, so how do people respond to grief? This is a really important thing. All of these things are normal. It is very, very common at the start of a grief experience when people have just been notified about the death to be in a state of shock. That's normal and that's healthy. And why is that normal and healthy? Well, that's sort of like psychological anesthesia and something that is actually part of our cognitive and emotional makeup that protects us from trauma. Over time, people may feel numb they may feel numb for hours or days or weeks. That would all be normal. People may actually feel that it's impossible that the person had, has died. And so when we use the term denial, we're not saying the person is pretending that someone's alive when they know they're dead. What we're saying is they just can't get their head around that reality yet. But as that shock wears off, Many people feel, and this is the most common feeling with grief, this overwhelming sorrow and sadness and yearning. And this is where people say, my heart is broken because truthfully the heart aches for the person who died, whether it's a parent or whether it's a child or whether it's a spouse or partner, or whether it's a sibling, that heart aches. And we actually do know that in the immediate phases of grief, people are actually at higher risk for heart attack or cardiac problems 
immediately after grief because much of the cardiac hormones that we associate with adrenaline and cortisol flood the system at that time. Some of you have probably heard the term um, broken heart syndrome. There have been cases of this reported, like um, the case of Debbie Reynolds, who died when her daughter Carrie had just died the day before. So these things do actually happen. Over time, people can feel this sadness as true depression that requires special attention. But for most people, it does not translate to depression. It translates to very deep loneliness. And we're not talking about loneliness like I don't have anybody in my neighborhood or there's no one in my family. We're talking about being lonely for the person who died. It's also very normal that grieving people have incredible amounts of anger. They may be angry at the healthcare system. They may be angry at themselves. They may be angry at the person who died. This is also normal. And they may also feel feelings of guilt. I didn't do enough. I wish I had told him I loved him more than I did. Um, oh, if I could only tell him I'm sorry. These are also normal reactions to grief, anxiety, or panic. When spouses lose a spouse. Um, not so common when middle-aged or older people lose a parent, but anxiety or panic can certainly happen. There, it's very often that people feel enormous sense of relief when someone dies particularly if the person who died was suffering before the death, um, they can actually This is really important to know and do try to remember this, that grieving people have memory problems. They have concentration problems and focus problems, but they do not have dementia. So concentration problems are normal when people are grieving. But many people who are grieving have thoughts of dying or being dead. A lot of people have behaviors that we associate with grief, like going to the cemetery every day. Other people have grieving behaviors, like never going to the cemetery. So if people have a behavior and they say, well, that's just part of my grief, it's just part of their grief. But the last thing I would mention is that many people do find their spiritual well-being challenged by grief. They might either feel this very deep sense of God's presence, or they may feel abandoned by God or angry at God. And again, all those things are normal. So some myths about grief. This is so important. One of the first and most important myths of grief that people say is that everybody grieves in the same way. We know that's not true. In fact, of all the ways that people are humanly different from each other, how they grieve is the way we're most different from each other. And we want to respect that. So when I say everyone grieves differently, that means also that they grieve differently than you do. And when we care for people, we don't want to make assumptions that we, in our grief, did it the right way. We just did it our way. Another common and there is no snapping out, and there is no just getting over it. The third myth is that family members are always helpful. Uh, well, we all know enough about families to know that that's not true. But the other thing is, even in the most loving families, if you just think about, if you had a family of five brothers and sisters and your mother died, and you would think, oh, you know, if his car. But when a, when a family experiences grief, remember everyone in the family is grieving. And so sometimes in a family, the people who would otherwise have been most willing to help you are now least able to help you. And that's why grief support groups are so important. The other thing that's a myth that I want to bring to your attention is that people should just not think about the person who died. It's so healthy 
to think about the person who died. And we want people to do that in ways that are constructive and healthy. Other myths about grieving. If you feel crazy, you are crazy. Well, just about guarantee you that you are not crazy. And I have been a therapist for 40 years and I know the difference between crazy and not crazy. So you're not crazy. And we need to reassure people that they're not crazy. If people feel strong emotions, they can also feel like they're losing control and they're not losing control. They're just crying or sad. Grieving your religion. When people are angry with God, the one thing I often tell them is they don't don't have to. That does not, strong grief does not mean a lack of faith. We will be the same as before the loss. They won't be. Grief changes everything and it changes it permanently. And we wanna respect that. So I have a picture here and I wanna walk you through this so that you have an idea of how we do think normal grief works. So if you look here at the bottom, it says grief process, and this is Strobe and Schutz model. And this was developed in 1999 and has been validated in hundreds and hundreds of research studies. So what I want you to think of is that there are four parts to grief here. And the first part of grief is called loss-oriented coping. That's what most people think about when they think about grief. And this is where you have to face the fact that the person you love is dead and gone and not coming back in this life. And this is filled with sorrow and yearning and loneliness. And the second part of grief is called restoration coping. And this is when people have to start a new life. And this is how grief works. Let's suppose we're talking about a widow and she's 85 years old and her husband died suddenly. He died suddenly of a heart attack and his name was Harold and she misses him every day. And she says, oh, how can I live without Harold? How can I live without Harold? And the first week goes by and now her children go home and her grandchildren go home. And now it's the second week and she says, how can I live without Harold? How can I live without Harold? And now it's the third week and all the casseroles from the church stop coming. And it's the end of the third week. And she says to herself, oh my gosh, if I don't pay my mortgage, I'm going to be in trouble with the bank. So she cries and she cries, but she says, I've got to figure out how to do this. So she goes and she gets Harold's laptop and she flips it open and she fuddles around and she finds his passwords and she gets into the bank software and it takes her five hours and she pays the mortgage. You can see she's getting her new life going, right? But she then she bursts into tears and she says, Harold, I did it. See, I did it, I paid the mortgage. And then she sobs even harder and she says, but you should never have died. I shouldn't have to pay the mortgage. So she goes from restoration coping, that new life, right back to the sorrow and back to building the new life and back to the sorrow. And so this third part of grief is called oscillation. And our brain move forward and move miss him cry it's all right miss him cry and our brain goes back and forth and back and forth and when we say grief is moving that's what we mean grief is moving between facing losing grieving people say things like I'm on a roller coaster, or I feel like I'm in a tornado, or it feels like whiplash, like I'm the last kid on a crack the whip game. 
because their brain is going back and forth and back and forth. That's called oscillation. But the fourth part of grief is every bit as important and that's taking a break from grief. And that's what's so, um, um, so distressing to people that um, they know they should take time off, but sometimes they say, I just don't feel ready to go out with my friends yet, or I don't feel like going over to my daughter-in-law's house for dinner, but they, they know they need to. So one of the things we can do to help grievers is to give them that gentle nudge, all right? To help them do some self-care. So now it's important to think about the people that um, we really need to worry about. So when we're dealing with people who have been grieving, not right away, but for several months, if people say to us, I have nothing left without this person. I want you to worry about them. And if people say, I can't control my emotions, I'm having such deep, profound, painful emotions, I do want you to worry about those people. And if after several months, you discern that people are isolated or they feel they're all alone in the world, I do want you to worry about those people. And if people feel very burdened by their social network to snap out of it or get over it, I want you to worry about those people. Those are the people that you, as, as professionals and volunteers working with older adults, that's when you need to worry. So this is your, yes, I need to worry slide, okay? So what do we want you to do about that? First of all, we want you to let us help you. So Caring Connections is here at the University of Utah College of Nursing. And we cannot take care of every grieving person in the state of Utah. But we want to help with those people who need us. Most people who grieve, remember I said each of us has the ability to grieve? Most of us can grieve with enough time, enough loving support, and good coping skills. We can get there. We can get there with them talking to you or talking to me at church or having the meals together at the senior center or, or the Meals on Wheels driver checking up on them. For a lot of people, that is enough. But people who need more help than that, or just simply people who want more help with that, should come to us. Um, I will just say, just in case I don't remember this later, at Caring Connections, we can also help you find grief programs around the country. Um, if you say, oh my gosh, I'm caring for this woman and her daughter died in Pennsylvania and her husband wants grief support in Pennsylvania, we can help you with that. Okay, but when it comes to Utah, we're your best shot. So our mission is to provide bereavement care to grieving people throughout the Inner Mountain West through our support groups. And our support groups are led by clinician facilitators, professionals. And, and we have a special outreach to University of Utah Hospital and Clinics but we also do clinical education in grief and loss to students in the health professions and to conduct research. And our program does quite a bit of research on advancing our understanding of grief. So that's our mission. Now, what do we do? Well, our main mission is to offer our grief support groups. So because it's the pandemic and because we're still dealing with the Delta variant, we are continuing to offer our grief support groups on Zoom. We have loss of spouse group, loss by suicide, loss by overdose, loss of a family member or friend group that we offer. And before the pandemic, we were offering these three times a year and we did maybe six groups each of three times a year. Well, now we're probably doing 12 groups four times a year. We're that busy. 
Um, we have also offered a daytime group, and usually this was for older adults who preferred to have a daytime group. And so if we fill a daytime group, we're happy to do a daytime group. So in the future, we hope to be in the future, we hope to be back to our four locations. We have groups in Salt Lake City, we have groups in Midvale, we have groups in South Jordan, we have groups in Orem, and before the pandemic, we were getting ready to start a group up in Farmington. We do need people to register. We do need to have a good assessment of their grief severity before they join the group. Uh, we charge $50 for a clinician facilitated eight week group and we offer scholarships and offer many, many free groups. So the other two things and the reason I wanted to talk with you about COVID is we also are now offering specific groups for families who have lost someone to COVID or have had a COVID affected death. And so if the family is now feeling an, another level of suffering because they couldn't be in the hospital or the nursing home or have the kind of funeral they wanted or be present in a way they wanted to, we offer a special group for those families and for families where the person actually died of COVID-19. So we offer those groups on Tuesday evenings and then we are also offering right now, we have two groups for COVID survivors. Now these are not grief groups. These are for people who are the COVID long haulers who have had the disease of COVID but have not recovered fully from COVID. And we have a Monday daytime group and a Tuesday evening group. So we have added all of these groups to our regular schedule of, of support groups. So these are the things we cover in the course of our group. So these are not just drop-in groups where people just come into a group and talk. We move people through their grief in a very gentle way. And we do this using this curriculum. And then we also um, just want to give you some tips. So besides just referring people to us, we want to give you a few ideas about how you yourselves in your own work with older adults and their families can support them through their grief. So first, this is the most important thing. Just show up, show up, be willing to listen to their painful thoughts and feelings without judgment. And this now I want you all to look at my face here for a second. We want you to use your own loss experience. Okay, so almost all of us, if you've lived and you're older than 40, you have probably had a loss in your life. We want you to bring your compassionate remembrance of your own pain to that without telling people how they should grieve. So remember your loss is your loss. It's not their loss and their loss isn't your loss, but you can gift them with your compassion and your remembrance of your own pain and suffering. One thing Salt Lake County Aging and Adult Services does better than probably any other service organization is help people with the practicalities of life, food, transportation, advocacy, and socialization. That grieving people need all of those things. The other way we support people is help them remember. So people in our grief support groups always say this, if people would just ask me, tell me more about your husband, or tell me a special story about that daughter of yours, or I feel so badly, I never got to know your brother, you miss him so much, tell me something about your brother. That is one of the kindest and most compassionate gifts that you can give that person is to help them remember the person who died. But it's really hard work taking care of grieving people. And the best thing you can do for them is show them a good example. Take care of yourself while you're taking care of others. 
I wanted to share this resource with you. Marion knows this resource. This is a book that we've published called Helping People with to Help People with Sudden and Unexpected Death. You can get this from our office. We want to have all of our Salt Lake County Aging and Adult Services and our statewide aging and adult services um, teams have access to this book to help people with sudden death. But finally, we want to talk about you. I just want to make sure that you're taking care of yourselves. We've all been through a lot. Um, and so just as a reminder, what compassion fatigue is, it's when the demands of the situation, and by this, I mean the pandemic, exceed the capacity of the individual. So some of us have gotten pretty close to that place. And burnout is when we're so overwhelmed with our chronic job stress that we can become exhausted or cynical or feel like we don't want to do our work anymore. So we want to be careful with that because this is the reality. Our entire nation and our entire world has gone through considerable trauma and continues to. And when people experience trauma, it affects them forever. And when people experience complex trauma with something that goes on for months and months and months, and here you're seeing pictures of Hurricane Katrina, when that goes on for months and months and months, it could wear us. So those of us who have worked in this through all this year plus, we know we have witnessed suffering. And when we witness suffering, we have actually participated in suffering. And when we've witnessed it, we take it into ourselves. And we are also then responsible for the story of the people we know who have suffered and we must bear this story into the future. So that said, this is one way that Caring Connections can care about you and Marion. I hope all of your team have seen these. We distributed them last January to aging and adult services staff throughout the state. Um, and wave your hand, Marion, if your staff got these. No. Okay, if you will remind me, we will send these to you. These are ways to keep your stamina going throughout the balance of the pandemic. We have one on mindfulness and self-compassion, connection and gratitude. These are not for your clients. These are for you as volunteers and staff um, to help you as you care for older adults. So Marion, you may need to nudge me if I forget to send these to you, but I will today. But as, uh, as we have a couple more moments as we wind down, we can all ask ourselves, how did, oops, excuse me, how did COVID change us? If you remember at the start of the pandemic, people were grabbing toilet paper and people were being very selfish. And instead we started realizing we have a lot to learn in this pandemic. All the things we couldn't control, all the ways we needed to manage our fears and our feelings, kind of how we had to regulate our intake of news because there wasn't much good news. And then finally, and really take a few minutes and think back on this. Think of all the many ways that you as a person and as a professional have grown during the pandemic. Think how kind you've been to your clients. Think about um, working hard to thank other people and be grateful. Think how hard all of us have worked to make sure that our clients, our patients, our residents got the care and the help that they needed. And then finally, we do have to think about what's coming. There is a lot of grief to come. This is the New York Times when we crossed 500,000. You know it's been 630,000 deaths now. So there is a lot of suffering to come. And what will we do? This is the early phases of the pandemic. I'm sure most of you have seen this. This is back when people were clanging pots and pans in appreciation for healthcare workers. These are all the disillusionment phases that we've had. Um, through the election and all of those challenging times. 
This is now the one year anniversary that happened. This is when the vaccine came. And now we're doing this long work of rebuilding our society after the pandemic. And that means, and this will be for the next several years of working through all of this grief. So for comments and questions, I will just remind you this beautiful quote from Fred Rogers just reminds us that we're all in this together. We live in a world where we need to share responsibility. It's easy to say it's not my child, not my community, not my problem, not my world, not my older people. But then there are those who see the need and respond. I, and I join Mr. Rogers in this, think of those people as my heroes. So all of you on this call, I consider you my heroes. Thank you for your good work. Here is my contact information and Marion has all of this. And I will shop, stop sharing my screen, Marion, and we can take questions. Is that all right with you? Yeah, that'll be great. So if you oh. have any questions, you can write it in the chat function or you can unmute yourself and ask. There is one already in the chat. It says, do you have any suggestions for helping small children with the death of a grandparent? Yeah, that's a great question, Nisa. And so let me give you a couple of answers. Um, the answer would be um, quite dependent on the age of the child. So we know um, children under the age of five do not think of death as permanent. So they have no distinction between you know, the cartoon character that falls off a cliff and hops up again like Roadrunner or a grandparent who dies and is and dies permanently. So under five, we just let those little kids go out and play and we answer their questions. Um, in early, um, early elementary through middle elementary, we want to answer people's children's questions honestly. We want to make sure we don't use language like grandpa went to sleep because if you do that, that's a recipe for a child never sleeping again. But we want to give them a fair um, description. So let's just say um, that a grandparent died of dementia or a grandparent died of heart disease. We would say um, your grandfather was, was old and his heart was weak and finally his heart couldn't beat again or um, grandpa had a disease in his brain and th that finally um, caused his death. Little boys and girls say, well, will that happen to me? And will that happen to you, grandma? Or will that happen to you, mommy and daddy? And that's when you say all of us die someday, but right now Grammy's very healthy and mommy and daddy are healthy and this is not something you need to worry about. With that kind of lead in then, Grandparents and parents can go in and talk through their own faith tradition. If you talk about heaven or you say, we'll see him again someday and we'll all have healthy bodies, that's fine. In terms of services, there are two uh, programs in Salt Lake that are designed specifically for the care of young children, the Sharing Place and the Bradley Center, both offer support groups for children um, the children have to have lost a family member. It can't be a friend. It has to be a family member. And so those are ap appropriate resources. Um, the two books that I like best for small children are, one is called Tear Soup, and it's the story of a grandmother explaining death to her grandson. It's a beautiful book. And the second book is called The Invisible String, and it describes how we're all connected through an invisible string. And even when someone dies, we have them forever. So that was, oh, I talked as fast as I could, and I said, but that's, that's my, my quick answer to that question. All right, now I wanna make sure I can get back to the chat box here. Okay, um, other chat, other questions? 
any other questions? Oh, I did that one. Any other questions that anyone wants to just unmute and ask while we're together? Well, it looks, Marion, like you've got some experts on grief out there. <laughs> yeah, maybe. All right. Thank you so much, Kathy, for joining us today and sharing so much great information and resources. That was super helpful. So Good. thank you. And Marion, uh, you'll you'll get the slide deck, and it will. It like I said, it's a big file. If it doesn't come to you, let me know. You're certainly free to share that with everyone. And I'll follow up and I'll send you these four PDFs. And if you could just share it with everybody who came today, I'd be very grateful. We want you to have these resources, everyone. All right? Yeah, great. I'll be happy to do that. Okay. I also wanted to remind you that our next week's webinar is titled Living with Anxiety. It's Kayla Cook from Valley Behavioral Health. She's the Senior Wellness Coordinator at Valley Behavioral Health. So hopefully you can join us next week for that. But if there aren't any more questions, then we just want to say thank you to Kathy and hope you all have a great afternoon. Bye, everyone. Thank you.